Hi, and welcome to part one of the Bible versus Masks. This is the next little series we're going to be doing here about comparing the Bible with one of the things that's going on big in the world today. And uh, I've been looking at this one for some time now, so I'm really excited to get into it. The more I dug into it, the more I'm seeing that there are a lot of different things the Bible has to say on different levels about masks. So we're just going to get right into it with uh, with some of the things that I found. And let me know in the comments below if you have any suggestions. If you see a verse that I took out of context, let me know. If you see something that I forgot or I missed, throw that in there. And we just want this to be an honest and complete uh, holistic view at what the scripture has to say about masks. So I'd love for your input on that as we go through this. Of course, as I have mentioned, may have mentioned before, my name is Sam and this is part of Morphite. Recently we've begun making a few changes with the way we do things, so keep in touch, keep an eye on the channel as we go, and we'll see all the different things that God has in store for us. Alright, so the Bible does not actually specifically mention this word masks. Uh, the, the word masks, if you search for it, is not going to come up. However, what we do have in the scripture is many biblical principles which apply directly or indirectly to masks, and they have to do with this idea of coverings or veils. So that's actually what we're going to cover in the first part here is this idea, this concept of coverings and veils, and see what the scripture has to say about that. So if you got your Bible, or you got a Bible app open, uh, follow along with me, and we'll start off in the book of Genesis today. In the book of Genesis here, we see Genesis chapter 24, starting in verse number 64. It says, And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel. For she had said unto the servant, What man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant had said, It is my master. Therefore she took a veil and covered herself. Now this is the first instance that I could find of this term veil, uh, spelled V-E-I-L or V-A-I-L, in the scripture. Here we see Rebekah veiling her face. And once she realized who it was that was approaching her, it was Isaac. And he was, of course, if you know the story, they're going to be married very soon. In Jewish custom, of course, women would use this cloth or this covering over their face as a as as a form of modesty, uh, either over their face or over their hair. Uh, the Jewish tradition was that, especially with hair, sometimes with face, but mostly with hair, was seen as a sensual thing, and so you needed to keep it covered up so you wouldn't tempt someone to sin. So this concept of being uncovered, of having a brazen face, you might see that show up throughout the scripture uh, to do with like loose women, is this idea that uh, they have no shame, uh, they may even be in various states of undress, all of these things. And uh, so the, one of, that was one of the earliest terms of this, uh, the earliest instances I could find of this term veil within the scripture was in this in Genesis here with Rebecca and Isaac. And it has, of course, this idea of modesty with it as she approaches, or as he approaches her. There's also in Exodus chapter 34, turn over to Exodus 34, starting in verse number 29. And we'll go through verse 35. And it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount, then Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. So, of course, this is the story of Moses as he was receiving the Ten Commandments from the Lord. And this is directly afterwards when he comes down and we see kind of the reactions that other people have to him and what he appeared like. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh him. And Moses called unto them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned unto him. Him, and Moses talked with them. And afterward, all the children of Israel came nigh. And he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. So when they first saw him, they see the glory of the Lord shining off his face, and they were very scared of him. And till Moses had done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and spake unto the children of Israel that which he was commanded. And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. And Moses put the veil upon his face again and he, until he went in to speak with him. So here we see this back and forth of as Moses is speaking with the Lord, he has his face uncovered because uh, he has nothing to hide from God. But when he comes out to the people, he uses a veil as a covering so he does not disturb them. He, they're not frightened of him. He can speak with them actually with a veil covering his face. All right, so that's in Exodus and we see Moses talking with Jehovah. This is about the Ten Commandments. If you go forward a little bit to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter number six, Isaiah chapter six, starting in verse number one. And here we see Isaiah talking about some of the things that he saw, these prophecies and these visions he had. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So these are angels he's talking about as part of this vision. And we see here that these uh, these seraphims have six wings. They have 
three sets of wings, and they've got two of them covering their face, they've got two of them covering their feet, and with the other two, they're actually using them to fly. So these two of these sets of wings, four of these wings altogether, seem to be more, at least are used, at least in this context, more as a covering for both their face and their feet. Uh, their purpose here seems to be a deference, seems to be covering up themselves from shining their own glory or from taking any any glory away from God, either either covering up their own or protecting themselves from his glory. You see here the very next verse, verse 3, uh, this idea of holy, holy, holy. The whole earth is full of his glory. So the idea is they don't want to take anything away. They don't want to steal any glory from God. And as, as a matter of deference, as a matter of reverence, they are covering themselves. We see this a lot throughout the scripture of the idea of bowing down before the Lord, uh, which is really interesting in contrast with the verse we just looked at, talking about Moses having an open face before God. And uh, so there's some, some contrast there. But we see this mask or this veil is used, this covering idea is used uh, in the context of glory, whether it's to allow yourself to be a part of glory, to see glory, to receive glory, or to keep yourself uh, in reverence away from that, to hide your face from it. If you continue on in Isaiah, turn over to chapter number 25, Isaiah chapter 25, starting in verse number 6. It says, In this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines in the, on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of wines on the lees well refined. And he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people, and the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death in victory, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth, for the Lord has hath spoken it. Now this is a prophetic passage and I'm not going to get into all of that right now because I just want to talk about the veil as a concept and as a symbol as we talk about masks. Uh, here we see that this idea of veil and this idea of rebuke are both negative things. We see, we see there in, uh, let's see, verses, what is it, verses, uh, he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. So there's this veil, there's this covering over the entire earth that is not a good thing because he sees there in the, la in the next verse as well, the Lord God will wipe your tears from off the faces and then the rebuke of his people shall he take away. So he's destroying this veil, he's wiping away their tears and he's taking away the rebuke of his people talking about Israel. So all of these things together are negative things that are ex in existence that God's going to remove as part of his salvation, as part of his uh, taking care of his people. And so we see then that the veil and the rebuke there are have a negative context as far as what they're covering and what they're preventing from being seen or seeing from one way or the other. If you turn over, turn over to the book of Psalms, Psalm 13, Psalm 13, starting in verse number one, it says to the chief musician, a Psalm of David, how long wilt thou forget me, O Lord, forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long shall mine enemy be exalted over me? So here we see David is crying out to God like many of the Psalms. He is very, he's in a dark place. He's suffering from this depression, this idea that I'm just, I, I can't see you, God. And it's really interesting here that he's asking God to show his face. He says that God's face is hidden from him. And so the connotation here seems to be that God's face is, is not shining on him. We understand God's face shining on us is a symbol of his love. It's a symbol of his approval, a symbol of his affection, his protection on us, that he's looking favorably upon us when we can see his face. But if his face is hidden from us, then we don't know where God is. We don't know what he's doing. We don't know, uh, we don't, we can't verify that he's actually looking upon us and caring about what we're doing. So here we see David can't see God's face. God's face is hidden. It's veiled from him. And that's a, that's a bit negative thing. It's a bad thing to him because he, he wants to see God. He wants to know what God's doing. He wants to appreciate the love that God has for him. If you turn over to the New Testament now in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter number 3, 2 Corinthians 3 starting in verse number 12, it says, Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Now before I go any further, this is, yes, referencing back to the verses we just read in Exodus, talking about that veil when Moses was coming down with the word of the Lord. He had the glory of the Lord shining from him, and he was taking the words of God, those commandments to God's people. So he's referencing this and he gives a little bit of a commentary on it and also goes into a little further explanation. This is Paul, of course, writing to the church at Corinth and he talks a little bit more about uh, what these things mean. He says, until this day when, but even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. So there's this idea that there's a veil, there's a covering, there's a prevention of knowledge between uh, someone who is hearing 
Moses being read, the Pentateuch, the Old Testament, and actually understanding it. Upon their heart, they don't, they have a limit to that understanding. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now, the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. So here we see all of these ideas coming together of God's glory, the spirit of God, understanding his word, and then that changing you and being able to comprehend his image and his glory in and through that. So we see all of these things working together here. Uh, the church here is, is being told that the Jews are still blinded to the truth, even though they're hearing the words of God coming from Moses. And we see that true liberty to see that glory of the Lord only can come through the spirit of the Lord, which we understand throughout the rest of the New Testament to be a result of salvation. That's part of the gift that's given to us that salvation is the Holy Spirit living within us and that comforter and who is there to teach us, to guide us into truth. All right, so let's go over then back a few uh, books, back to the book of Matthew, back to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27, starting in verse number 50, and we're going to talk here specifically about the crucifixion and when Christ died. Matthew 27, starting in verse 50, says, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now, this, this is one of those verses that I don't hear people talk about a lot, but it's obviously there's some crazy crazy stuff going on right at the moment when Christ actually died, when it says there that he yielded up the ghost. And we, we use that term even today sometimes of giving up the ghost, the idea that you relinquish your soul, that you, you are letting go of life and passing into death. So upon Christ's death on the cross, that veil at the temple in Jerusalem was then torn, was rent by God himself from top to bottom. Now this veil, if you study it out, was an extremely thick thing, and it was a, a part of the tabernacle instructions that would then carry it over to the actual temple in Jerusalem and given by God himself to protect or to separate between everything else and everyone else and the holy of holies. You can see that listed out in Exodus chapter 26 and in Hebrews chapter 9. Uh, there's a little more commentary on that. Uh, but with its destruction, when it was torn in half by God, then that's showing that this way, this, this separation is now made clear. There's now a clear path. There's now clear access between the common man, the dirty man, and God himself. Christ destroyed the veil so that man could now approach God. Man can now have a chance to talk to God himself. All right, let's go then to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, starting in verse number 16. And I know we're kind of, seems to be going all over the place as far as the different concepts of a veil, but that's kind of the idea in, as we're studying this idea of masks, veiling, and covering, is we want to get a holistic, comprehensive view of the idea of a mask in and of itself. Not specific context, not specific usage of it, but how, what does the Bible say about masks on the whole, and then we're going to work through a couple different things through the rest of this series, and um, hopefully we'll all come to a, uh, a the same conclusion as we look through the scripture. If not, let me know. You know, let me know if I'm misinterpreting or or misguiding on anything. Luke chapter eight, though. Luke chapter eight is the last one we'll look at today for part one. Luke chapter eight, starting in verse number sixteen, it says, "No man, when he hath lighted a candle, covereth it with a vessel, or putteth it under a bed, but setteth it on a candlestick, that they which enter in may see the light. For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest. Neither any." Anything hid that shall not be known and come abroad. Take heed, therefore, how ye hear. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken, even that which he seemeth to have. So this is one of Jesus' parables. Christ is speaking just following after the, his explanation of the parable of the sower. We won't go into all that right now, but he's talking in the parable of the sower, of course, about the word of God and your reception to it and what you do with it and how you and how you internalize the word of God when you hear it, how you respond to it. So this implies then that this light he's speaking about, as he goes right into this right after that, he's speaking about the word of God, uh, possibly salvation, but the word of God as it exists in your life. Uh, th the thing I have written down is this idea of the word of God shining in your life. Because he said here, right after he explains the parable of the sower, then he says, no man may have lighted a candle, covereth it with a vessel. So as he's talking about the word of God, our reception, our response to it, then he goes into this idea of a candle and this idea of a, whether you're letting its light shine or not. So there's this accountability then also in verse number 18. <clears throat> 
where he says, whether we put Christ and his truth on a candlestick or whether we cover it up, uh, we're, we're going to see consequences for that. If we have it, to him shall it be given. If we're letting that light shine and, and be, uh, be enlightening us as well as shining out through us to the world around us, sharing the gospel, sharing the word of God, then it says, to him shall be given. And whosoever hath not... From him shall be taken even that which he seemeth to have. So if we're hiding it, we're gonna then there's consequence for that as well. So that seems to be the uh, the explanation here about this idea of covering. And the reason I went into that one, even though it's not talking about masks specifically, is it's talking about the word of God and whether we cover it or whether we uncover it. And those were the concepts there. So as far as conclusions, uh, just on this first part, uh, the mask throughout the scripture is is not shown specifically for the purpose we see it today, which, uh, well, we're, we'll go into some more, some other things. We're going to be talking about masks as disguises. We're going to be talking about masks. Uh, we're going to be talking about things to do with health and all of that. So we'll get we'll get into all that stuff. But I wanted to start with kind of a basic concept of uh, this idea of a covering, this idea of a veil, and just in general, what does the scripture say about it? So we see we see throughout these verses that the idea of a mask can be positive or negative. But it's not based on the mask itself. It's based on what is being hidden and whom, from whom it is being hid. So whether it's whether it's glory, whether it's uh, someone hiding their face out of modesty because they don't want to show forth something, we see that there's different reasons why things are being hid and maybe might be the opposite for why someone else is hiding their face. But like clothing in general, uh, a mask prevents other people from beholding what is beneath it. So it is a covering. A mask is a way of preventing uh, your countenance, your face from being seen by someone else or from uh, someone else or from something that is within you coming out or something that was out from coming in. Just like the veil in the temple. It's the idea of a veil, the idea of a separation, the idea of keeping things apart. So that is part number one as we talk about uh, masks in the context of the scripture and what the Bible actually says about it. I hope that was at least a little bit of good information there. We'll charge in a little bit more next week as we go into part two. Uh, please, if you like this content, share it with one other person today. That's all I ask of you is if you like this video, if you want to see more videos like this, you can like it, you subscribe, do all that stuff, but please just share it with one other person so that we can get this message out as we want to talk more and more about God's word and get it spread around the world. Thank you so much for watching, and uh, if you like more fights, subscribe to the channel and you can see more stuff on YouTube or whatever platform you're hearing this on, and otherwise we will see you again next time.